Let's do it. In this video, we're going to be showing some common mistakes as well as some tips and tricks for carbon steel, 4130 chromoly, stainless steel, tips for cup sizes when TIG welding aluminum, and even some tips on TIG welding titanium and how to avoid the number one biggest mistake on titanium. I started out to do a really short product video on my TIG Pro kit showing each cup and what it's used for. It's kind of a Swiss Army knife of TIG kits, cup for every situation, but it kind of morphed into a much bigger video talking about some tips and tricks and some common mistakes. We'll start off talking about carbon steel and low alloy steels like 4130 chromoly. Number one, remove the mill scale. Trying to TIG weld over mill scale just takes all the fun out of TIG welding. Right now things are going pretty good on the clean spot that I ground off. That's about to come to an end right about now. Look at all that stuff floating around there. It's like trying to weld in a bowl of cornflakes. That mill scale is going to be jumping onto your tungsten. It's going to be clogging up your gas lens screen. It's going to be taking all the fun out of TIG welding. If you're having trouble seeing the puddle at all, first thing is to make sure you can read fine print about 18 inches away. If that's fine, the clear cups can help you a little bit. They light things up, kind of like a flood lamp. They're not the be-all, end-all, but I really like them for filming. And I have found out that when I go back to a pink cup, it's like somebody dimming the lights. Another tip is to alternate TIG and aluminum beads when you're training and practicing. When you're running beads and you're just stuck, you're not getting any better, it can help you from getting in a rut. Another common mistake is too tight of an arc. I'm always preaching on holding a tight arc, but if you hold too tight of an arc on aluminum, you're going to crap up the electrode. And once you do that, you really need to stop and break the tip of that electrode off and start with a newly prepped clean electrode. That takes all the fun out of TIG welding too, trying to weld aluminum like that. For TIG welding aluminum, I usually prep my tip something like this, and then I just kind of usually let it ball however it wants to ball. Here's a technique that will keep you from having to clean electrodes a lot. Tight arc while you're moving forward, lengthen the arc while you're adding TIG rod. I have found this technique to be very helpful on T-joints and lap joints. And it's kept me from cleaning electrodes a lot. And once again, if you're just learning, alternating beads between a piece of aluminum and a piece of steel can keep you on your toes and help you learn quicker. Just a friendly reminder, if you order a TIG Pro Kit, you can choose between the MRT100 TIG Torch Holder from Stronghand and the MRT50, which is a lower profile. Your choice, both are great. One of the cups that comes in this kit is a ceramic Jazzy 10, one of my favorite cups for stainless and chromoly. With the added diffuser, it hardly requires any more gas than a number 8 gas lens, but gives you a lot better shielding results, lets you use a lot longer stick out, and just gives great gas shielding. The next one up is a number 12, really almost the same as the 10, just, just lets you use a longer stick out. It's great for chromoly and stainless, and you can see right there there's a very large area of argon coverage. A lot of welding textbooks and manufacturers' literature will tell you the optimum electrode angle and filler wire angle, but all that kind of goes out the window when you're welding cluster joints like this. It's great to strive for the proper way, but the proper way is not always the only way. The Furic Ceramic 12 really comes in handy when you need a long stick out. This is about a three-quarter stick out. It can handle a one inch, even an inch and a quarter with no problem. Rule of thumb is generally you don't want to use a longer stick out than you need, but sometimes you need a long one. And you don't want to sacrifice gas coverage when you have to do that. Nothing wrong with having a little discoloration on 4130 chromoly or even stainless steel, but if you have to do a two-pass weld, that second pass is going to go in way better if that first pass is shielded like this. Another really good use for the 10 or the 12 is tick brazing with silicon bronze. I'm using about probably about two pulses a second here, but the extra argon coverage really helps keep that puddle from scumming up too badly, helps it flow, makes a big difference on silicon bronze. Now we're going to talk about stainless steel a little bit in something called the three second rule. 
Because heat can build up with you with a stainless, you need to get your puddle established and get it moving within three seconds. Two seconds is even better. If you take too much time getting started, getting your glasses adjusted, getting your helmet adjusted before you ever start adding rod and moving, heat can build up on you so much that it's hard to outrun it. And you're going to get excessive discoloration, you're going to get warping, it's not good. Another important consideration with stainless steel is purging the backside. I'm not purging the backside right here because this is 8th inch wall thickness, very unlikely that I will melt through. However, if it was thinner where I was likely to melt through, or if I wanted to get a full penetration weld, I would need to shield the backside with argon. Here's what happens when you don't. When you penetrate through the backside on stainless with no shielding, no backing, no argon, you get this condition. It's called granulation. It's called sugaring. It is a definite flaw, and in some industries, you'll get blackballed, one being sanitary tubing. One on the left had a good purge, one on the right had no purge. For aerospace welding tests, you'll commonly weld in a purge fixture like this, where you get purging on the backside on a plate. On aerospace welding tests, it's helpful to have a long stick out and a larger cup for a couple of reasons. One, you see everything better. It gets it out of the way, gets the cup out of the way. And number two, it gives you a little bit of leeway in helping you keep the hot tip of that rod shielded. Certain alloys, titanium, nickel alloys, stainless, don't like it if you come in and out of that argon shielding with the hot tip of that rod. Even on cold rolled steel, where you don't necessarily need an oversized cup like this, it's helpful to get that good argon shielding and to be able to use a long stick out when you need it. Well, now let's talk about aluminum for a bit and the cup sizes normally used on aluminum. The number one thing on aluminum is making sure it's clean before you weld it. There are lots of different ways to clean aluminum and it depends on how oxidized it is, but you don't want to bear down on a, on a worn out flap disc and create a lot of heat and smear oxides. You want to use an abrasive that's intended for aluminum or a wire wheel that's intended and dedicated for aluminum. A number five cup is a favorite cup for a lot of people for TIG welding aluminum. It works great for a lot of applications. Some of the best TIG welders I know use a number five standard collet body for TIG welding aluminum. One reason is because it really confines the etching area and it confines that cleaning action and directs that energy into the puddle and helps you get a full penetration weld when you need it. You'll see a really good example of a full penetration outside corner weld right here. This is 090 thickness 5052 aluminum. My friend Brad Goodman doing his pedal pump technique here. Fully penetrating this corner. You can see the back side here it looks like a caterpillar inching along. Sometimes you have to blend off the outside of a weld and if you don't get full penetration like that, you won't have much left. Sometimes it helps to use a large gas lens like this with a number 8 cup. And the reason I would do that is to get more cleaning action because you get cleaning action where that argon flows. So on a piece of cast aluminum like this, you can see that cleaning action just dancing all around outside of the path. And I'm letting it work before I ever puddle anything. I'm doing a cleaning pass there and I'm going to do the same thing here and you can see it kind of cooking away the oxides. You can see that black stuff just kind of dissipating as I slowly go back and forth. I don't want to puddle it until I get some of that stuff cleaned off. Right here you can see it kind of cooking away and cleaning right ahead of the weld. There's a small path there. You don't want to outrun it. I like to use the large gas lens for walking the cup too. And it helps to have several different sizes. So a number six fits inside a groove like this where you can wiggle it along. And then as you get out on the hot pass and the cover pass, you might want to increase the size of the cup. It's a number eight right here. And then for the cover pass, switch all the way to a 10. Once you're outside the bevel and you're truly walking the cup like you would walk a 55 gallon drum across the floor, it's good to have the right size cup to do that. I know a lot of people don't weld titanium, might not ever weld titanium, but in case you do, you need a large cup like this, and here's a tip for you to avoid the biggest mistake on titanium. 
You might think it's argon shielding. You might think it's cleaning. And those are important, but the number one mistake that will really mess you up is using the wrong rod. Is accidentally not knowing it's titanium and using a stainless rod or a nickel rod. Or maybe you know it's titanium, but you accidentally left a stainless rod out on your workbench. It turns it into glass. You don't want that. An aerospace test weld on titanium would typically be done in a fixture much like this one. You want to be really careful, as I mentioned before, to shield the hot tip of that rod with the argon. Never let it come outside the argon envelope. Keep a fairly tight arc, roughly one amp per one thousandths of thickness, up to about fifty thousandths works pretty good. And use a large cup, like the Furic BBW, for gas shielding. A large cup like this can also help with certain nickel alloys and stainless steels that have a small aluminum content. It really helps clean up the puddle. Sometimes you don't need a big cup at all. In fact, sometimes you need to use the smallest cup you possibly can. If it's a Saturday, the welding supply is closed, you can't get any more argon, you got to get the job done. A number four is really helpful for flash tacks and burst tacks like this. Saves argon. You don't need any more coverage than that for a small tack. A number five cup, gas lens, works just as good as a collet body for getting a full penetration weld without using a lot of argon on aluminum. A number six gas lens comes in really handy sometimes for a single pass fillet weld like this when you want to walk the cup. I had about 50 parts of these to do a few years ago and I did a lot of them just like this walking the cup. I know a lot of people like a number five on aluminum I've found that a number six gas lens is a super good all-around cup for a lot of aluminum joints, like this outside corner here. And a number seven is a great all-around size for a lot of different steel jobs like this, unless you get a pretty long stick out when you need it sometimes. Still get good coverage. For stainless steel, a number eight seems to be a favorite of a lot of people. And I can understand why. Stainless steel, sometimes you need that long stick out, but you do need good argon coverage. Here's a good example of why I don't use the standard collet body cups on stainless. I've got a fairly long stick out here, but I'm using around 20 CFH. It should be getting good coverage. It's just not. I've got the stick out a little too far, and it's not welding good. It's welding muddy and sluggish, and it's all gray. I switch over to a number eight gas lens without changing anything, same gas flow, like night and day. Switching over to a Jazzy 10 with those extra diffuser screens in there does an even better job. Not quite as big a difference as there was between the standard collet body and the number eight gas lens, still a difference. Less discoloration with a longer stick out. And that's why I hardly ever use the standard collet bodies for stainless steel anymore. I hope you enjoyed this video on my TIG Pro kit here. We've put together these kits for both the 920 style torch as well as the 171826 style torch.